tonight. Really pleased to host you and to, to join you. My name's Nick. I work for the, um, the Children's Conservation Board on a number of projects and just a little bit of housekeeping before I introduce you to Ian Waller, our chair for the evening to get the session, um, get the session kicked off. Um, so please, if you can, if you can keep your mic um, muted and your video off, it helps a lot in terms of background noise and, and for bandwidth for presentation. So if you can, please keep your your mics muted and your cameras off, that'd be really helpful as we go through the session. We're expecting anywhere between um, three and 400 people tonight. So as much as we can do to keep it um, smoother, that'd be much appreciated. Um, we will open up the session and we'll ask John T to obviously run through his presentation for 40, 45 minutes or so. And then we'll hold questions to the end. So any questions you do have, feel free to, um, to ask them. If you could put them into the chat, um, we'll monitor those and we'll then send those across to Ian to ask of, of John T at the end of the session. So if there are any questions, please put them into the chat. That'd be brilliant. Um, we will be recording the session as well um, when we start. So that will all go live on, will go up onto our YouTube channel. Um, so you'll be able to watch that again afterwards if you missed it or you wanted to, um, to send to other people or watch it again, we'll, we'll put it up onto to our YouTube channel. We'll send the links around when, when they're up. So get a chance to have a look again. Um, we'll also be sending, if you don't mind also, or you'll be sending around a feedback form as well. We're really keen to get your thoughts, not only on, on the session, but any other future ideas that you have of, of the topics or any other things that you'd really like to find out more of so we can design more of sessions like this and hopefully one day uh, in real life as well. So we'll, we'll be sending a feedback form. Um, for those of you on the call that are basis accredited or basis registered, um, each of the six sessions we've registered with basis for CPD points. So you'll be able to, um, to get yourself a single point per session. Um, so this session will be worth one point as well. So any details you need, I can let you have the, um, the course registration number. So let us know, we can send that through to you so you can um, reclaim your CPD points. And also very excited to say that we have um, worked with John C and the guys at FarmEd to organize a a trip for 20 lucky winners from a prize draw from this evening to go and have a, a four hour session over at Farm Ed with John T and his team looking in, in practice in real life at the kind of things that John T is going to be talking about with us today. So so we'll we'll um, we'll do the prize draw after tonight and we'll let you know if you're, you're lucky to get in on that trip. But a brilliant prize there to actually go and, and really kind of see the work that John T is talking about in action, really kind of see the results and really quiz John T and his team. So really excited to have that prize lined up for say 20 lucky winners from tonight but if you're lucky to win it we'll, we'll let you know after the event um, and last bit for me really is just say if you are of a social media mind if you were going to tweet tonight we've got a couple of or we've got a hashtag um, hashtag Chilton's Farmers if you wanted to put that in your tweet we can keep in touch and keep the conversation going on um, on Twitter if that's something you wanted to, to tweet about after tonight's session so so enough from me um, Great pleasure to introduce Ian Waller. If you don't know Ian, Ian is the chair of our Central Children's Farmer Cluster and uh, wears a number of different hats involved in, in projects and is going to chair this series of sessions. And I'll hand over to Ian for you to, um, to tee the session up. Have fun, everybody. Thank you very much, Nick. Um, as Nick was saying, um, this is number two of a series of six. Um, the idea behind them is to get you a bit more um, informed about where we might be going with countryside stewardship at the present time and then leading into environmental land management and it's just really to give you a sort of flavor and um, some pro pro provoke some thoughts on um, farming in a more sustainable way which we're all being encouraged to do under the new environmental land management scheme um, for those who uh, don't know who i am i will introduce myself so i'm ian waller i'm a, a farmer in the Chilterns, um, a tenant farmer, um, mainly arable, and uh, I do keep some um, herdwick sheep and uh, just keep me amused and uh, help me graze my cover crops through the winter. Um, I also have been a board member for the Chilterns Conservation Board for the last eight years, and I currently also am the chair of the Central Chilterns Cluster Farmers, um, and that's a Heritage Lottery funded cluster farmer group. So we're quite privileged that we've got some um, good hard cash to put things um, on the ground and implement various ideas we have. So um, that's enough about me. Um, so I'd like to introduce you to our speaker tonight, John T. He's um, been practicing sustainable and region agriculture for at least the last 20 years. 
he used to be a flag advisor in a previous life. And, um, and that was, as we all know, involved in agriculture, that was an extremely valuable service that we as farmers funded, but unfortunately not fully implemented anymore, but there are still some remnants left of that. And we should all take advantage of that if we are in areas where we have got flag advisors still. Um, he's also a tenant farmer um, on a national trust holding in the Cotswolds. He's um, won various prizes for his sustainable farming um, with the National Trust. And um, also he's currently in his role at the moment is um, head of sustainability at Farmer Ed and, or Farm Ed, um, which isn't Edward, it's farm education. And he's also a Nuffield scholar. So, um, and his uh, scholarship was on sustainable farming. What a surprise. So thanks very much, John T. Um, if you'd like to take over and present us your presentations and we will stop at the end and ask questions of your presentation. So thank you. Um, thank you for having me. It's an absolute pleasure to um, be speaking to you all in Chilterns or across Europe and the globe, I can see from some of the participants. Absolutely amazing. So I'm John T, um, head of Regen Ag and Sustainable Food at FarmEd. And I'm going to whiz through all sorts of pretty pictures and slides and then lots of questions at the end, hopefully. Um, I shall share my screen and hopefully someone will shout up that that's working. How's that? Can you see that, Ian? Thank you. Or... Yeah, that's great, John. T. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, so as, as Ian said, um, head of Regen Ag and Sustainable Food at FarmEd, and I'll explain a little bit about FarmEd in a minute. Um, also a farmer at Conigree Farm. Uh, please do follow us at FarmEd, me at FarmEd and me at Conigree Farm, if you're that way inclined. And if my start, if it starts to move, there we go. Um, the contents of tonight, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the challenge facing us all, hopefully just stir things up a little bit, um, and then a very brief intro to FarmEd and what we're doing there. Then I'll introduce Regen Ag in the broadest sense and the five key principles plus a few other things that are important to us at FarmEd. A little bit about the lessons I've learned at Conigree and then open it up for questions. Um, FarmEd, what is it? If you've not seen it, I'm no, I know one or two of you have been, I can see your names, um, but with the, the new Centre for Farm and Food Education uh, based at Honeydale Farm in the Cotswolds, um, near Chippy, near Chippy um, Norton, um, Shipton under Witchwood, Burford, that corner of the Cotswolds, the northeast. Um, we're a community interest company. Um, we launched about a year ago, a very soft launch. What a year to launch an events business and education business, but hey, we're still here. Um, many of you will know the owners, the founders of FarmEd. It's Ian Wilkinson and Celine Wilkinson of Cotswold Seeds. Um, Ian and Celine passionate about doing things differently, the environment, soil, diversity and food. Um, they bought Honeydale Farm seven or eight years ago and have slowly built it into the most wonderful demonstration farm and a place for education and food and knowledge exchange. Um, it's absolutely stunning. Do have a look at the website, um, education space, food building, um, 107 acres, and I'll show you a little map in a minute. But what are we about? Why are we here? Um, basically, we're here to accelerate this transition that we're all part of towards regenerative farming futures and agroecology and holistic management and sustainable farming, call it what you like, but also around the food system. It can't stop at the farm gate. We have to talk to retailers, consumers, chefs, millers, bakers, cheesemakers, abattoirs, the whole lot through the food chain. So we're going from soil to gut health and everything in between. And we do that by education, uh, knowledge exchange, research, um, events, and inspiring events, and some personal development and one-to-one -one stuff as well, such as mentoring, advice, and consultancy. So a very broad remit, but we believe that's what's needed. Um, there's Honeydale, that's Farm Ed right in the middle. Um, it's only 107 acres, but you know, most farms still in the UK and across Europe are quite small, at 57, 65 hectare average. We try and squeeze a lot into our 107 acres. The top ground there is all arable, and we've got an eight year rotation with herb rich lays, heritage wheats, under sown barleys, oats, wild bird covers, cover crops, all sorts in the eight year rotation. 
We've got trials on Herbridge Lays. We've got a CSA, a market garden, three acre market garden, sand foin plots, lots of field margins, just introducing agroforestry. We've got bees and an apiary at the southern end of the farm. A permanent pasture, ridge and furrow, a traditional orchard, natural flood management scheme, ponds, water, lots of hedgerows, all sorts of stuff squeezed in. Scrub as well, a little bit of rewilding, if I dare say that word. Um, the farm's managed by mob grey sheep. We're just introducing a micro dairy and we'll be looking at other livestock too in the future because they are crucial. Right at number one there on the map is Farm Ed. That's the centre, the centre for education with the buildings. Um, the big pizza oven, the kitchen, so we can tell food stories and get people around the fire. Wonderful place if you've not been yet. Um, all sorts going off, as I said, there's just a few pretty pictures really. Um, mob grey sheep in the middle, an aerial photograph. Under sown, we've got the heritage wheats, which we're finding really interesting. Um, lots of different varieties of heritage wheat in the same plot. Some of our mixers, the cover crops and the wild bird crops, we've got over 30, 40 different species in the mixers now, trying different things. And of course, we'll come on to talking about roots and soil very shortly. You might ask who the audience is. Um, I've probably touched on it, but it's everybody. Um, drives my marketing team up the wall, but we must speak to everybody. We must get out of our echo chambers. Um, so we start at our local community level and schools and local families, and then into the universities, such as the Royal Ag and Coventry and Oxford, not too far away, working with students and researchers, and then our farming community. And we've just started a cluster group in the Northeast Cotswolds, which is growing really quickly, really exciting. And then growers, let's not forget horticulture and growers in this, crucial to what we're talking about. Agronomists and advisors, crucial. New entrants, people who do not know that they're regenerative farmers or growers yet. So we're trying to work with them, the, the, hopefully the future of farming and growing. And then beyond the farm gate, the foodies, the chefs, the career changers, there's the businesses, the entrepreneurs, the eco entrepreneurs, the NGOs, the poly policy makers and government. We're trying to talk to everybody. Quite a task, but we're getting there. It's been a really exciting first year, 18 months. If it wasn't for COVID, it would be brilliant. What can you do? If you, can, if you ever come to see us, and hopefully 20 of you will be doing soon, um, you can explore the farm. We do lots of farm walks and open days of various types. Uh, we try and inspire people, events and gatherings and conferences. You can bring your group and meet at Farm Ed. You can eat with us and we talk about you know, the importance of food and nutrition and where it's come from and local sourcing and sustainable sourcing. Lots of knowledge exchange and education work, lots of modules, one day, two day, three day modules, uh, conferences, um, all sorts. There's something for everybody on a knowledge exchange point of view. Um, little bits of research, nothing massive yet. Uh, we don't want to go too heavy on pure research, but plenty of farm demonstration and trial sort of work at muddy boots level. And we always get asked, you know, people come to farm ed, they like what we do, they say, can you help us? And so we offer some mentoring, some consultancy and advice support wherever we can, and we're hoping to grow that in the future. We have something called the Farm Med Programme, which is our suite of knowledge exchange and education work, because um, we believe knowledge exchange, education and mindset is probably one of the biggest barriers to regenerative thinking, regenerative agriculture and transition and making these big changes. We're putting an awful lot of focus on the knowledge exchange and the one-to-one -one, face to face work if we can and as i say we cover everything from soil health to gut health and everything in between there's a quick sample of the farm ed menu if you can see that um, we've designed it around food nibbles starters main courses the kids menu the takeaway menu and specials modules on soil soil health agroforestry holistic grazing holistic management beekeeping orchard management, tree planting, and then the specials such as the Oxford Real Farming Conference in the field. If you've ever been to Oxford in January to the Real Conference, we're hosting a Muddy Boots workshop, Oxford. Uh, we were supposed to do it last June, but we pushed it to this June, fingers crossed. And then things like a Regen Ag Lit Fest coming up, hopefully this year, might slip to next year, but we shall see. So lots happening. So do sign up to our newsletter. And there's just a bit of PR. There's the buildings, um, eco buildings, absolutely stunning, very inspirational place to be. 
So do come and see us. So I've talked about farm and farm education and farming, but what is a farm? Um, a stupid question, maybe, but I think we should always go back to these type of definitions and just try and get our head around what are we talking about? What is a farm? Lots of definitions, of course. Um, I quite like this one. A farm is a synthesis of land, the people and the business, a blending, a new entity with a personality that is the farm. And this is crucial. No two combinations are the same. Each farm is unique with its own character. The land contributes its climate, topography, soils, precipitation, biological diversity, and the ecosystem, of course. And what other industry or business is in a fixed location? We have to work with the natural capital and the assets that we have. People, you, bring their passions, the skills, labor, relationships, creativity, and emotional patterns. And the business, hopefully, brings its financial capacities, its reputation, goodwill, the culture and the market that we all operate within. So whatever we do, policy-wise, there's no one size fits all. We all have to make our own way through this, despite policies and prescriptions and schemes and forms and regulation. We have to try and work with it wherever we can. And each of us and each farm must develop our own strength and place and work that out. And that's not always easy. And the last bit is crucial. When we change one thing, everything is affected. The knock-ons, the farm ecosystem is really complex. So we've always got to be thinking of unintended consequences. If we plough that field there, what happens to the village down the road? If we remove that hedgerow, what happens to the ecological connectivity? If we stop growing that spring barley crop, what happens to the lapwing or the corn bunting? We must always be thinking about the consequences and the links. The challenge, you know the challenge, there's too many of us. We eat too much, we're depletive, and there's only one planet, massive challenge, nothing new there, we know that. But at the same time, we've got to provide the full range of public goods. And again, I don't know another industry that's expected to deliver X, you know, a thousand widgets, but deliver another 10, 20, 30 things, mostly for free. As you know, public goods, whether it's wildlife, genetic diversity, landscape, public access, etc. At the same time, of course, we've got, we have got climate change. It's happening. We see it every season. I've never known seasons so different to what we've had over the last five years, whether it's drought, snow, heat, wind, too much water. You know we're seeing it all the time. It is real. And it's complex. And at the same time, of course, most of us are not financially resilient or viable. And I haven't picked this slide or this year from DEFRA for any particular reason. This is quite common, probably two years out of three, the DEFRA stats from the Farm Business Survey are similar to this. If you've not seen this slide, you know, it's um, quite telling. But basically anything below the line is losing money. And the bits below the line on most of those um, farming sectors is the food production bit, the agriculture. So cereals lose money. Grazing livestock, upland and lowland, lose money. Mixed farming, probably the thing we really want to promote, loses money. Crazy, absolutely crazy. Above the line is agri-environment, diversification, and the BPS income, which of course we know is now going to drop quite quickly and we're facing that cliff edge. How are we going to build sustainable, resilient businesses with that in front of us? We need something different. We need a new system. Absolutely, for sure. And at the same time, we've got to work within the market and the culture that we live in, whether that's the backlash against red meat or dairy, whether it's the dietary concerns that we all have. You know, most of us are slightly overweight. Many of us are far too overweight and we're killing ourselves with what we eat. That's got to change, too. But both of those scenarios give us opportunities as well. So we shouldn't be too negative. And at the same time, as you know, can we get to net zero? What are we going to do about carbon and CO2 equivalents? I'm not a chemist, I'm not a physicist, but I seem to remember that there are things called carbon cycles and methane cycles, and they are cycles. 
and stuff goes into the air and comes back down. We've got photosynthesis, we've got cows burping, goes back round again in a cycle. Okay, should balance out. It'll only balance out if we stop ripping fossil fuels out of the earth and burning coal and diesel and other fuels and destroying our soils and really breaking down that natural carbon cycle, that methane cycle. Cows aren't killing the planet, of course, it's the fossil fuels that are. But that expectation is, is that farming is a dirty industry, it's all our fault, and what are we going to do about it? But let's use that, we can use that as an opportunity, because only farming and forestry really can solve this problem. The answer is beneath our feet. So I don't know about you, but as a farmer, I'm totally overwhelmed. Um, as, a, as a parent, I'm overwhelmed. As a consumer, I'm overwhelmed. As an advisor stroke educator, I'm overwhelmed. I've never known so much change, so much expectation, so much pressure. And that was before Brexit and COVID. So yeah, I don't know how we're all coping and surviving. So what will the future look like? Let's try and be a little bit more positive. Um, well, I don't think it looks like this. I don't think it looks like protein made in a lab. I don't think it looks all about plant-based stuff, highly processed and money going to shareholders' pockets. I don't think it looks like this. I don't think it looks like, you know, let's call it sustainable intensification, shall we? Getting more from less and being more efficient and maybe more intensive. Not a word I always use, but if we, yeah, well, I, we can put animals in buildings and sheds and squeeze more in and feed them and recycle their waste and feed them perfectly and monitor and censor everything. But I don't think that's the future most farmers want or most consumers want. It might be highly efficient, but is it effective? Is it going to deliver what we really want? There are some benefits, but not always. So I come back and I have done for a few years now back to this thing called regenerative agriculture. And there's a picture of Gabe Brown, which I'm sure many of you know, which we'll come on to later. A quick definition, and um, where did this thing called regen come from? Um, for me and for many, it's about going beyond old school conservation and sustainability. We've done farm conservation now for how many years? Decades, hundreds of years, as a flag advisor. We've done sustainability, what, for four years? Uh, for, sorry, 40 years. Um, we banded this thing around. Um, we spent millions on trying to be sustainable, trying to protect what we have today for tomorrow, but not enough, nowhere near enough. Every metric we look at is still going down, whether it's farmland bird numbers, not locally, but maybe at UK level, European level, national level, uh, international level, whether it's farmer health, whether it's soil health, whether it's water quality, whether it's CO2 equivalents going into the air, still negative, negative, ne negative. We're not sustainable. So we have to do something different. Where did regenerative approaches and the terminology come from? Um, well, some of you would have come across people like Darren Doherty, Alan Savory et al, lots of them, particularly America, Australia, uh, Canada, New Zealand to a degree. But regen, it came out of desperation. It came out of farmers at tipping points came out of farms where their soil is absolutely knackered and depleted and couldn't grow very much and yields were depressed and losing money and farmers would be you know, bankrupt, less inputs, no machinery, couldn't afford fencing and new buildings. So regen came out of that feeling of desperation and needing to do something different at low cost. Maybe that's where many of us are now and where we'll be heading in the next five years. The key principles and practices of regen are all about increasing things and enhancing. So increasing biodiversity, not sustaining, not conserving, but increasing, going beyond. Building better soil, not protecting soil, going better than that, building new and healthier soils. Improving water catchments, enhancing nutrient cycling. So these positives, going beyond. The key thing is about capturing carbon, of course, capturing carbon in the soil. Topsoil, yes, but deeper down, definitely, where we can. Above ground biomass is important. But of course, that breaks down or it can break down quite quickly. So the soil carbon is the most important bit of it. But we can you know, obviously get more biomass above ground, too. 
if we get that right, we can reverse global trends of atmospheric accumulation of CO2 equivalents and hopefully do something about climate change. And only farming and forestry, I believe, can really do that. If you get it right, and there's lots and lots of examples now across the globe, and UK catching up a little bit, but look at America, look at Australia particularly, if you get it right, you get increased yields. So yes, we can feed the world before anyone asks that question. Better animal welfare, if you do it right. Lower inputs, yeah, absolutely. We don't really need nitrogen and sprays in a regenerative system. We can do away with all of them, if not, well, most of them, if not all of them, which should reduce your cost drastically and hopefully improve your profit. And through diversity, we're gonna improve climate um, instability and make farm business more resilient. And if you get it right, happier farmers and healthier farming businesses and families, and hopefully health, healthier and happier rural communities too, if you get it right. For me and farm ed, we have to go beyond the farm gate, as we say. So we're looking at things like you know, landscape scale uh, restoration, quality community engagement, getting people closer to farming and food again, local food systems and supply chains, and that results in jobs and connectivity and sales and more profit too. And hopefully bring all the waste and everything into the system and it becomes a circular, a regenerative circular economy too. Um, and you will know terms like agroecological farming, agroecology, organic of course, holistic management, uh, permaculture, um, biodynamic, wonderful, all wonderful. We're all there in the mix together. We, have, we draw from all these practices and all those lines are very blurred. There are differences depending on who you speak to, but Regen draws from all of those practices. When I first started to get into Regen, it was very much about practice, that's fine. But slowly but surely it's become a movement, a movement of people that are passionate, a movement, a social movement around knowledge, around sharing a retail and a sales and a direct selling movement. So it's bigger than just individual agronomy practices, which is really exciting. So I think that really blurs the lines even more between regen, ag and agroecology. So maybe the two sit together really, you know, really perfectly. Um, what does regen mean on the ground? I'm just gonna go very quickly through the five key principles. Principle one, this is the one you'll know all about anyway. Minimize soil, minimize soil disturbance. Get rid of the plough if you can, basically. So move to min till, zero till. No dig horticulture. If you are going to plough, and ploughing is okay in some circumstances, um, I'm not totally anti-plough. We plough at Farmed still um, in the rotation, the eight year rotation. We plough maybe three years out of eight, which the soil can totally cope with if you've got really healthy, vibrant soil. It's not just no, no till. Um, and just leave the soil alone as much as you can to do its thing. Allow the soil to thrive, the mycorrhiza to do its stuff and to grow and to build that soil food web. And that chemical intervention too is crucial. You know, the chemical, chemicals are soil disturbing. It is part of um, a cultivation practice to use chemicals. So let's move away from that where we can too. Maybe more perennial crops can help and pasture cropping too. Maybe not ploughing all the time. Principle two, maximise crop diversity. Move away from monocultures. There isn't a single ecosystem on this planet, I don't think, that is a monoculture. It's not natural, it doesn't work, it doesn't function into the long term. And that applies to cereal crops, forage crops, grassland, biodiversity, we need polycultures. So at Farmhead, as I've said, we've got this nice diverse four year, uh, eight year rotation with four years of cereal and four years of herb rich lay. The cereals have diversity within them, both between species and varieties. And the herb rich lay is about, I think it's about 14 to 22, depending on the plot of different herbs, grasses, forbs, etc. all doing something very different. And things like companion crops come into that too. We might not be harvesting them, uh, but we can do other things through companion and under sowing, etc., such as vetch or clover in oilseed row. Principle three, keep the soil covered. 
I remember those bad old days and I still see it. Yeah, you get your seed rape off in early August. Um, we're struggling for time. We might cultivate, maybe might plow, or we'll go and power harrow as well and then leave it for a bit. And then we're going to drill and roll. And by this time it's October, November. Oh, it got too wet. We've left it till March and put a spring crop in and the soil hasn't been covered for four or five months of the year. Awful. We shouldn't be doing that anymore. It should be illegal unless the weather really prevents it. But there's lots of things we can do to keep the soil covered, to physically keep the soil where it should be in the field, but also to keep the soil living and to keep the nutrients and the carbon in the soil, not volatizing off or disappearing. But we need to keep feeding the soil too, even through the colder uh, winters. Um, principle four, integrate grazing livestock. This is crucial. You can be regenerative without livestock, but it is better to include them in a system. Um, it's faster, you get deeper impact. So you get, you've got all these wonderful green covers, you've got cover crops, you've got a diverse rotation of herb rich lays, what we're gonna do with them. Well, I don't really want them to go into a biodigester. I'd much rather they went into ruminant livestock and effectively turn that sunlight into Sunday dinner. Photosynthesis is where it's at. Let green stuff grow, lots of diverse green stuff, so not just ryegrass. Let the cattle and the sheep turn it into high value, nutrient dense protein. And they'll spread the nutrients out across the ground for you while they're at it. And they'll stimulate the methanotrophs in the soil and the bacteria and the, the soil flora to do their stuff and actually build a better, healthier living soil. So it's utilise those. And as long as we're not putting fossil fuels in, we can be more or less carbon neutral, if not carbon negative. Principle five, see, seek living roots all year. You've seen the diagram on the left many times. If you overgraze, if you nibble stuff down to an inch or two, the roots constrict and die. If you've got tall grass grazing, graze the best bit, yeah, maybe a third of the plant, move those animals on move them, get rid of them, you know, move them to the next cell or the next paddock, but don't overgraze. That keeps the roots thriving, working, going deeper, doing their stuff, talking to each other, putting soil exudate out there, feeding the microbes and working together. More perennial crops too, you know, we mentioned pasture cropping, but I think there's a big future for doing more perennials in the system wherever we can. And of course, we can feed our roots in other ways with compost teas and mulches and biostimulants to really get that system going to pump prime the system when needed. But keep those roots. Think about what's underground at all times. So what? You know, there are five key principles. What does it really mean for you, for your business um, in the Chilterns or further afield? Um, hopefully, if you do all those principles and get it right and you know, get a system that suits you and your farm, you will have healthier, more resilient soils, full of life, more accessible nutrients, which is key. Christine Jones, the little comment in the middle there. Today's soils are not deficient in minerals. They are deficient in microbes. Most of the nutrients are there waiting for you. You just need to release them or let the, let the soil food web release them for you. It, it can be done, okay? And it's not just about soil carbon, it's all about the micronutrients too. And importantly, it's about the structure of your soil. Um, nice big clumps of soil hanging onto each other, glued together with the soil exudate, lots of space for water and air, functioning soil, not compacted, not slumped. If you get the structure and the soil food web working, really powerful stuff, and you can half. You can reduce your nitrogen inputs if you wish, because you'll have healthy plants. And more resilient when it's droughty, and more resilient when it's really cold and wet too. And ultimately, more carbon. If you've got that carbon back into your soil, and we've sucked it out of the air, put it where it belongs, and it's a very stable form of carbon below ground, more than probably planting trees everywhere which will have an effect maybe medium longer term, but we can build soil quicker and lot more carbon in than um, many other uh, methods. That little image on the right of my screen, I think it's the same for you, uh, soil exudate. There's a root, a white root, little fine filament 
root with a bit of soil exudate being excreted. It's the most wonderful stuff in the world. So that's where we are, building soil exudate pathways and the, the liquid carbon pathway, if we can. Um, what does it mean? Um, health crops. Healthier crops with functioning roots, crucial. Um, if you can get them working, it re require less N, less crop protection, stronger plants, not being attacked and not falling over. Um, there's some soil at Farmed, lots of nice conglomerate of soil holding it together, lots of root mass going nice and deep. A little image to the right um, from Christine Jones, um, two wheat crops or two wheat plants. Far right, very white roots, very bare, not much exudate and not much soil attached there to the root and that plant is struggling. That was conventional wheat with 100 kilos of fertilizer thrown at it. Very traditional. On the left, pasture cropped, diverse, some clovers in there, no fertilizer. Look at the roots, they're totally different, doing different things. So the crop on the left, better yields, less input what it could mean to you. If you're a pastured farmer, if you've got livestock, you know this, more diverse and nutrient, um, or more diverse swords leading to a nutrient dense diet for the animals. Uh, so better for the animal health, better daily live weight gains, less costs, you don't have to feed them so much cake or minerals, and less vet med use, maybe reducing on wormers, for example, reducing on feed buckets and boluses. Let the plants do the work, let the chicory, the sanfoin, the bennet do the work. They're there for you. Um, diversity can mean better yields too. If you get it right, um, you've probably heard of over yielding. Um, an individual crop might yield a little bit less, but to put five, 10, 20 crops together in total, they'll provide you with more. Because they're all doing different things underground. All their roots are searching for different things at different depths, different root architecture. They support each other and talk to each other. Now, of course, that brings problems about how to harvest. Well, if you're a grazier like me with cattle and sheep, it's not a problem. Nice, diverse sword. If you're making forage, not a problem. A whole crop, what have you. If you're after wheat, might be a problem. But this is where ag tech might come in to help us clean stuff and to select and to do and to harvest in different ways in the future. It can be done. And if you work with your miller, local miller, maybe they don't mind that there's two or three varieties of wheat in there. Um, better profit, that's another thing, and happier farmers. I've mentioned that, I won't go into detail. I'm sure you've all read Dirt to Soil by Gabe Brown by now. And I'm sure one or two of you know a Pasture Fed Livestock Association and the work we did there on um, it can be done and the financial benefits of moving to a pasture-fed and regenerative system. But there's lots of examples now out there of better profit and happier farmers. And let's not forget the consumer here, more nutrient-dense food. Lots of work now showing that if you've got healthier functioning soils, the crops that you produce are more nutrient-dense. So what? Well, that means you've got added value produce for your consumer. And by jolly, we need that, don't we? We need healthier food going into the system, which might mean they pay a bit more for it. It might mean that we need less land for the food that we produce. So think about feeding the world again. It's not just about calories and yield. Let's think about our food in, from a nutrient density and quality point of view. And taste, it tastes better as well. Of course, none of this is new. Um, I'm sure lots of you have read The Farming Ladder by George Henderson, which is all about low input farming and, and, and diversity and mixed farming and enterprise stacking. You know, back to Android Voice and classic soil, grass and cancer, that link between soil and human health. Beans, corn, squash, nothing new. They knew, we knew to grow things differently at different heights, doing different things, agroforestry, permaculture, forest gardens, photosynthesis, nothing new in that. Other things to quickly consider, um, enterprise stacking. So let's now, we now want a really diverse regenerative farming business with lots of different crops and animals doing different things. We can now start stacking enterprises. So we can have a diverse rotation. We can put some cattle on there. We'll then maybe follow it with sheep. We might follow it with chickens, picking at the poo and the insects and the seed. 
you might put some pigs through that afterwards as well to rootle it all up and to do a bit of browsing and grazing maybe and, and finding a bit of goodness We've got lots of wild flowers and stuff all around the edges now so let's have some beehives and produce some wonderful honey so now instead of just one crop of wheat maybe barley some oilseed rape we've got maybe 10 enterprises all working together over yielding lots of local food all playing off each other really exciting so do have a look at uh, concepts of enterprise stacking where you can. Think upwards too. Crikey, my Twitter is full of people planting trees this winter and agroforestry, wonderful stuff. From arable alleys and planting in between to silviculture and more pastoral approach with cattle and sheep under trees again. Great for shade, shelter, browse, putting carbon back into the soil, water retention. Have you noticed the grass is always greener around the tree or next to the hedge? It's not by accident. So do think about agroforestry and where trees fit into your system in a land sharing um, perspective or approach. Um, it's not just dog and stick farmers like me into regen. There's tech out there, whether it's your drills or your sensors or your robots or harvest technology, maybe in the future or seed separation. Um, there is lots of wonderful tech that can help us be regenerative and some of you will prefer the tech than the grazing bit I guess. Again it can't stop at the farm gate, we need consumers and retailers and the supply chain on board otherwise the whole system will fail. Now some of us are taking it um, to heart and just getting on with it, short supply chains, direct selling, adding value at home, selling to our local consumers, others are taking it a little bit further with bigger brands working with retailers and some retailers are now really getting quickly on, on board with the regen thing. You know, look at America, General Mills, your Cheerios will be regenerative by this time next year. Microsoft buying up carbon credits and working with regenerative farmers now. North Face, regenerative woolly hats. Uh, Timberland, regenerative leather in some of their boots. So it is now happening through the supply chain there's a bit of catching up to do in this country, but it will happen. There's two or three brands stroke assurance schemes waiting to be launched. We're not far away. We do need more data. That's the first question that everybody asks is prove it. Where's the data? Um, there's some, um, some academically robust data, but we definitely need more. And we can all play a role in that and start collecting stuff and working with researchers and, and monitoring. Um, we need probably some labels and logos here to help us ultimately so the consumer can work out how to buy this stuff and how maybe we can add a bit of value. But if you look at something like the Pasture for Life, Mark, you know, there's already you know, something that's out there that's doing a really good job promoting regen and diversity that uh, farmers can engage with. And there'll be more in the future. I end up coming back to this thing about land sharing versus land sparing. I'm a land sharer. I think we can do lots and lots with every acre of our ground, produce food and biodiversity. But I'm not totally against land sparing and a bit of rewilding. Every farm is different and we can leave space for nature in different ways on different farms. But I'm a land sharer and I think that's where regen fits in really well. Just to finish, um, my story, Connie Gree Farm. It's nothing remarkable, but it's a little bit special. Uh, it's 180 acres, we're organic, we're pasture fed, we're regenerative, we're in the heart of the Cotswolds near Burford, if you're ever passing. And um, for years, we've been trying to rebuild soil health, restoring wildlife habitat for farmland birds, limestone, species rich limestone, grassland, etc. Connecting to our local community through food and uh, tourism and experiences. Utilizing all sorts of different agroecological approaches and enterprise stacking. So do have a look at the website if you wish. Um, that's the farm there. We've got traditional Hereford cattle, our grazing tools, grazing herb rich lays and species rich limestone pasture. Uh, Cotswold sheep, again our rare breed, turning sunlight into Sunday dinner. And none of those animals ever get any grains, no soya, no concentrate. So totally 100% grass fed or pasture fed, which is crucial. And that gives us a higher nutrient density meat and a nice story to tell. And no inputs, so it's you know, it, the profit, the gross margin and net margin per animal is really good. Uh, we've got beehives now because we've got wildflowers and margins everywhere, thanks to stewardship. Bottom right, we've just launched a market garden, a joint venture with a young grower. 
Um, James in the middle there, a no dig organic market garden selling 50 different products, particularly through the summer, um, to the local market. And that's probably the best farming decision we ever made, actually. Um, from three acres, we're growing an awful lot of uh, healthy food. And in the middle, you know, we try and share it with people who bought some teepees and we, we tell stories and we entertain and we celebrate on farm too and try and connect with our local community. We've been at the farm 15 years. When I first came to the farm, um, I was pretty traditional. I was from a farming background and I had sheep and I fed them cake and I lambed in February and I had clins and I wanted triplets everywhere and cattle, you know, I pushed them and I wanted to feed them concentrate too. And I had some spring barley and I was sure I could make profit out of wheat one year. Never did, never did. So slowly but surely my mindset changed. I worked with agri-environment wherever I could and the landlord, the National Trust, and slowly but surely became organic and regenerative and then pasture fed. And since it changed, since you know, we really took the foot off the input pedal, we've hardly had a single foot issue with a sheep, hardly any. No, we don't get foot rot anymore. We might get a, a thorn or you know, a twisted ankle now and again on the stones, but nothing major. No prolapses, not too many lambs, not too big, not overfeeding them. And this is the one that many people struggle to believe. I don't, we've not had a metabolic issue with a, with a ewe for about five years. And that's since we stopped feeding cake. So we took the foot off the pedal, we selected the best genetics we can, the grass-fed genetics, we've got no problems. They graze through the winter, we do defer grazing, we do some mob grazing, we feed hay through the winter where we have to and bale graze, but they do well. The triplets do well, the twins do brilliantly, the singles occasionally a little bit big because we lamb a little bit later now. We lamb in April and well into May when the grass is growing. But the gross margins again on the sheep are really good. Um, very little antibiotic use, um, you know, no major issues. If we've got a caesarean, maybe on a cow, we've got some antibiotics or something like that, but you know, no routine use at all. Less worms, you know, we're moving through species rich pastures now to clean herb rich lays. A um, bit of clean grazing, but the chicory and the samphoin, bird's foot trefoil, doing their thing, which reduces cost, of course, no cake, no nutrient licks, no furt, less vet med. And slowly but surely, we are getting better soil. It's hard to measure sometimes, but I have seen you know, soil improvements. The farm was absolutely shafted when I took over, being contract farmed by quite a few people, arable rotations, and the farm was not in good health but we are get a, getting better living soil slowly but surely. We're up to organic matter contents, if you use uh, loss on ignition metrics, of somewhere between seven and 12%, um, varying between permanent pastures and the herb-rich lays. And definitely more wildlife. Yellow hammers, corn bunting, an occasional gray partridge and lapwing. Uh, we did have tree sparrow, but the sparrow hawk took those. Um, and one or two, there's lots of brown hair, you know, it's a bit, of a bit of a haven, really, for wildlife. And of course, we could do more, like uh, everybody else. So generally positive. Um, nearly finished. Um, I'm just, I often get asked, you know, what books would you read? Where's my inspiration come from? My initial inspiration came from being a flag advisor, but thinking back to how dad was ripping out hedges and plowing out pasture and pulling down trees and traditional buildings and went from a beautiful mix farm to a intensive arable farm in the 70s and 80s. That's what drove me to change and to do something about the environment, to think differently. I was very lucky to be a Nuffield scholar uh, about five years ago. I went around the world to meet people like Joel Salatin um, and talk about regen and mob grazing and pasture farming, very lucky. And then some wonderful books, you know, Gabe Brown again, anything by David Montgomery I'd really recommend. Holistic management, I mean, I'm not a total fan maybe of, um, Alan Savory's work, but some wonderful stuff through it. And holistic management is surely where it's at. We should be doing more of that. Alan Nation is a great one on uh, pasture and grazing. Lots and lots out there. Have a look at Chelsea Green Publishing um, if you want to dig down into some of those titles. There's lots on um, their website. Lots of other resources out there. You know, where do I turn? Um, Agroecology, the website. It's a wonderful funnel of knowledge exchange and case studies and academic reports. Do check Agroecology website out if you haven't already done that. 
um, a little plug for Cotswold Seeds and their work on legumes and herbage lays and diversity. Uh, Organic Research Centre, wonderful. Um, some of the um, stuff coming out of Coventry and the RAU and some of the other universities in Newcastle, really good. Uh, Pasture Fed Livestock Association or pastureforlife.org, NIAB, Affinet on um, agroecology. Uh, people like Integrated Soils, Joel Williams, wonderful consultant advisor from Australia and sometimes in the UK. The Rodale Institute in America, one of my favourite places when I did my kind of field scholarship. Lots of wonderful work there on regenerative organic systems and great evidence. Um, anything by Christine Jones, um, wonderful. Um, if you want a good consultant, think about someone like Niels Caulfield, um, who really gets it. Groundswell, the best um, summer conference on the market. You don't need to go to cereals anymore, just go to Groundswell. That's where it's at. And there's many, many more out there too. And hopefully, of course, farm it. And I'll stop there just without, I'll, I'll leave that on screen for a couple of minutes. Um, that quote from Vandina Shiva. Thank you. Questions, please. Thank you, John T. That was really interesting. Um, certainly riveted to that all the way through. Um, as ever, um, it stirred up quite a few questions. Um, the first one being, um, is uh, quite a lot of people ask this, um, you talk quite a bit about not ploughing and then go on to mention you do plough at, at farm ed. So yeah. there are conflict, you know, I, you know, the plough's long gone from me and, you know, that would be absolute sacrilege if I ploughed a field again um, for me personally. But how do you balance that at farm ed? Uh, every farm is different. I'll always, that's my get out of jail card on every answer. Every farm is different. But... Um, I did say minimise soil disturbance. So yeah, min till, zero till, wonderful. Doesn't suit every system, doesn't suit every farmer, uh, every instance, every crop. Try getting from a herb rich lay with chicory in back to wheat without a plough. <laughs> so there are sometimes compromises that need to happen. So at Farm Ed, we do plough. Uh, we have a Spanish plough, very shallow plough, three inches. Just turn that topsoil really gently. And if you're only doing it, say, three years in the rotation out of eight, you've got a really resilient soil that bounces back straight away. It hardly notices. Um, so, again, that, that's I, I wouldn't plough every year and I wouldn't deep plough at all anymore. Um, but occasionally ploughing is OK. And um, I was listening to Christine Jones last night on the Oak Bank um, uh, webinar, which is really good. Uh, Christine Jones said you know, she'd rather, rather shallow plough you know, every few years then use glyphosate. And that's the, that's the approach that we take at FarmEd. We've tried roller crimpers, um, which work to a degree, but we just don't get the frost and the extremes to kill stuff off. Uh, so we've only got two options, glyphosate or plough. <laughs> and I'll stop there before I get lynched. Um, how do you incorporate all that biomass um, into your farming system with hedgerow coppicing and all, so much going on um you're, you're storing a lot of carbon there but obviously you've already mentioned you plow um do you think there's much carbon release when you plow um yes i would have thought so um hard to measure we've got above ground carbon yet yeah, in trees and shrubs which are pretty stable we've got you know maybe in an eight-year rotation we've got five or six years of forage crops we've got grazing and then dunging and a lot of it going straight back into the soil that way uh, we've got some mulching, topping and um, roller crimping, putting green stuff and brown stuff. Don't forget, we need brown stuff as well, not just green to get the balance right back into the topsoil. But the topsoil can only really hold so much organic matter. Um, the key is to get the organic matter deeper um, to the liquid carbon chain. So through the roots and through the soil exudates and through photosynthesis, we get very hung up on the organic matter on the surface in the top in the top 30 centimeters but the key is to get it as deep as possible with deep rooting and very healthy crops and that's where it will stay a lot longer and that's where we often forget soil sample yeah tricky in the Cotswolds when you've only got six inches of soil anyway <laughs> it's tricky and tricky in the Chilterns as well we're not much <laughs> different up here so um here we go back on the questions again um 
if someone wanted to start on this regen journey, what would you say is a real key first step you really ought to be looking at doing to start that journey? Um, speak to people, go and see people, go and see lessons that have worked and things that have gone wrong and build a community because it can feel very lonely. Um, it definitely felt lonely five years ago. It doesn't feel lonely at the moment though, because we're all talking to each other, a lot of us are. Um, but yeah, knowledge exchange, lessons, get off your own farm and then try stuff and accept things go wrong. Things go wrong in an intensive conventional system every three years. So it's okay to get things wrong in a slightly bonkers regen system too. <laughs> good point, good point. Um, how would you go about calculating your stocking rates when there's mob grazing because it you know mob grazing is the, the sort of new in terminology um very difficult um, we talked about it last week with james rebank where he's mob grazing some of his meadow pastures but there's that waste element in the back of your mind always you've got to get over it. it's it's not waste it's obviously being returned to the soil but yeah. you obviously need to get the right number of animals to the right area and it's sort of calculating that with different stock stock so sheep or cattle obviously yeah i mean it's about getting to know your own farm adapting it every year you can plan it out the you know, adaptive uh, grazing planning and holistic management planning um, to give you a good idea but you've got to adapt every year every season is different stocking rates um, we all calculate them differently anyway you know, some of us calculate stocking rates you know, grazing animals a hectare of forage some of it do across the whole farm what about the animals you've had inside all year and you brought forage in how do you calculate that so you have to get to know your own farm work with things adapt it as you go well if you can get really properly into mob grazing you know the size of the animal roughly how much forage they eat you're doing some bricks testing and understanding the nutrient value of the green stuff you're planning it out as much as you can graze, move, graze, move. You've worked it out that you've got plenty of rest between the grazers, yeah, at least 28 days, maybe 30, 40, 50 day rest before you come back and graze the same spot again. So you have to work out how much space those animals need. And all our farms are so different. My traditional Herefords are three quarter size. So what, you know, what do they need? It's not in the textbooks. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. Um, so Regen Ag, um, where do you think the carbon emission, emissions are with that? You know, the quantify where you see that. The emissions are, what, the losses? Yes. Yeah. Um, still using lots of fossil fuel. Uh, so we have to get that down wherever we can. Um, yes, our soil management, even on regen, every regen farm is different. Everyone is somewhere slightly different on a journey. And, and there is not a point when we're fully regenerated. Um, so there will still be soil losses on some farms. Um, but fossil fuel is the biggie. And where does fossil fuel come? Yeah, it's diesel, but it's also artificial nitrogen and the steel and the concrete in your farming system and the pesticide use and the transport, um, not just um, actually, not, not just the diesel and the soil stuff. So many and varied. Use something like the car farm carbon toolkit to help you work that out. And that, you know, that is work, that's working better every every update it's pretty wonderful now and i believe that's next week's talk is that right oh what a lead in thank you so much for that <laughs> prompt <laughs> so um do you um you're obviously passionate about what you're doing and you know it works but how do you think we should you know we've already sort of partly answered it you know it's, it's getting more people involved it's very difficult for you know people to change from the what they've always done into just taking that first step to, and it as you said it's different for everybody because even like you know livestock's not similar across all livestock farms but certainly for the arable guys you know for me it's been some quite big challenging steps um you're not quite so involved with the arable side of it but you obviously research that side of it and know about it so where do you sort of see that the, the first big steps for an arable person really is, is it getting livestock on the farm because not all of us can have livestock on the farm just like that others the country they swamp with livestock and and then where will the price be yeah well let's get I'll tackle it in a different way let's get animals out of sheds and back out onto farm then spread them out a little bit more that's number one uh number two joint ventures is where it's at yeah there's plenty of new farmers new entrants young folk who want to graze and do things differently 
um, southwest and east of England and all over the shop and there's great evidence of that um, happening and they don't need lots of capital. They start with 10 cows, 100 sheep, some electric fencing, you're in business, one water trough. And that might be something that the, you, your, the arable farmer might help invest in anyway because you can see the benefits for your soil. Um, it doesn't have to be livestock to get started, or it doesn't have to be ruminants anyway. Chickens and pigs do a wonderful job, um, and you can cut soya use down, you can cut grain use down and get them in a pastured approach. You can't get away with it totally, but um, there are benefits there. Um, the market garden, you know, as I said, the, probably the best farming, farming decision we ever made. Three acres will be employing, or the business will be employing three or four people by next year. And turning over hundred thousand pounds off three acres that's more than the rest of the farm put together <laughs> and feeding 60 families within five miles with fresh produce every week so that's why i'm not too nervous of the plant-based movement because actually us farmers can produce plants to sell to <laughs> yeah yeah you're right with the livestock you know i've got a, a grazier here hasn't got a farm um he's not particularly you know he's in his early 20s he's got um three or four hundred ewes I've, I've got the ewes and the lambs here at the moment finishing on my winter cover crops um it works you know but i still think we will struggle with the volume we need to help um, um promote this regen and getting these animals into the system so sort of final question now where do you see the future with countryside stewardship environmental land management you know do you see there being big things in there to really push this further forward and, and really help us in England to actually in, encourage this regenerative um, groundswell, as it were? I want to have a better yeah. word. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes and no. There, there are promising noises. There are one or two options we can use, like the Herbridge Lay option and things in stewardship. Um, who knows what the sustainable farming incentive thingy will look like and whether that really will focus on soil health in a proper deep way. Um, so I'm still very dubious. Um, I think those that are making a transition and doing things differently are kind of doing it despite the system and showing that it can be done. You know, the public goods money is brilliant. We do need it and we can fit it around, but I'm not certain it's going to drive a change to regen and agroecological approaches yet. Um, I think we've been bitten too many times by promises of great schemes and computer systems that work and are reactive and flexible. Mm. Yeah, I think I agree with you, but I'm sort of still like you, optimistic, there will be something in there. And I'd like to think we're thinking in a more open minded way and adapting new practices that we would be in a really good place to seize the opportunities that hopefully will be there in environmental land management to improve this type of farming really so it will be some good stuff yeah way. so thank you ever so much for your input tonight it's been really interesting it's it's really nice hearing from somebody who's actually doing it themselves on their own farm as well as telling other people how to do it because i think that that's some really joined up thinking and you've got substance behind what you're actually achieving so Thank you everybody for um, coming along tonight. As John T already mentioned, um, next week we're talking carbon and uh, we've got Becky Wilson coming along from the Carbon Cutting, cutting Toolkit to help us um, understand carbon sequestration and all the impacts and pluses and minuses that that'll involve. Um, so again, thanks very much for turning up. And I, I've really enjoyed it. I hope you've all got something from it and have a good evening. Thank you.